Oh, you know, uh, another thing I, I, I really want to know about, because I, I, I hear about it, people talk about it. So you serve as a production designer in Saul 2. Yeah. And then you start doing second unit director work on Saul uh, 3 and 4. How did that, yeah. like, was it that just your relationship with Darren, he wanted you to do that, or was that something else? Well, we were, you know, I mean, we were working very closely at that time. Um, you know, I, I mean, Darren and I would literally sit across the table from each other and and be talking about how we were going to design shots and, and how the traps were going to work and, you know, and just like brainstorming. It was it was actually a really, really fun time and, and a really great creative process. And And I think that the producers, you know, the producers were feeling that Darren wasn't coming back for Saw 4 and they saw how closely we worked together on everything. So around mid I can't remember exactly when it was, but about mid pre-production on on Saw Three, they suggested that I direct Saw Four, mm-hmm. and they offered me Saw Four. And in order to sort of, you know, see me at work as well as to help out with the production on it, because Saw Three was also a bigger movie. It was the first one we did that was ten million dollars as opposed to four. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they said, well, why don't we have you direct second unit on this as well? You know, we'll get more bang for our buck out of it. It is a bigger movie, so we need that help. And um, it just made perfect sense. You know, I, I was familiar with the cast. The cast knew who I was. And so I got to, you know, sort of cut my teeth that way. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, and then uh, certain life circumstances got in the way of that. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Def- yeah. Definitely things I want to talk about later if you if you yeah. have uh, if sure. you're inclined. But, uh, you know... Uh, when it comes to directing the that third or the second unit stuff, uh, did yep. you direct? Because I'm not really sure who did what. But were you the one who directed the shot with Betsy Russell uh, and Obi uh, from the first uh, from the second film, or was that Darren? Uh, this is just a short little shot on the outside, you know, with uh, with everybody. If you know what I remember, if I'm ta- what I'm yeah. talking about, it was they were yeah they were they were in the park. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, I did that. Okay. Yep, that was I directed that for sure. Yeah, we um, then that was one of the few sort of outside the studio shots we had by that point. <laughs> you know, um, you know, one of the things that we had always prided ourselves on was that everything was shot in one studio. All the sets, all the locations, all the apartments, police stations, hospitals, everything were all in the studio, mm-hmm. in one studio. And um, you know, there were times where, you know, there were times where. We had like 30 sets standing all at once in the studio, and uh, we could just move fluidly from one to the one to the next. Um, you know, the the gaffers and grips could go around pre-lighting and pre-setting um, the the studio, so we could really move quickly. And and it, you know, that's part of the success was just having a well-planned out thing. And you know, that was that was really Dan Hefner's doing to make sure that it was kept really tight and really you know, the streamlined process all the way through. And and even the fact of, you know, keeping the budget limited. It's it's it would have been really easy to say, look, the movie just made a hundred million dollars. Let's make a twenty five million dollar saw movie. Mm-hmm. You know, or a thirty million dollar saw movie. Let's let's see if we can like, you know, make five hundred million dollars in the box office. And um but there was a discipline and and I think it was really wise to not do that because, you know, they all you know, the the thing about having parameters like that is that you have this control that you keep, you know, it doesn't grow too big and the machine, the machine functions properly, you know, Mm -hmm. um, you know what toys you have to play with. You don't go beyond that. You know, we don't have helicopter shots. We don't have car chases, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so you have these rules and, and because of that you go, okay, well, where does it cost money? I mean, it costs money to have a transport team. You know, we had a transport team, but they basically brought the unit to the studio and then picked up actors, you know, (laughs) from from their hotels and that was it so we didn't need like 13 guys changing you know the location of the unit every day and moving the whole production around a a city or that sort of thing which makes you know makes it far more streamlined and and uh it makes far more possible Mm -hmm. um yeah it kept our days our days limited you know we never really went over the 12 hours on friday nights dan hefner would come in and say i'm pulling the plug today at 10 o'clock and that's it you know, what we don't finish today, we finish on Monday. And um, and that made a big difference. Didn't burn out the crew, right? Mm-hmm. As, so. as speaking as someone who's uh, worked on f- various film sets throughout Texas where I am, 
Uh, it, it really is hard to to keep it that uniform, that well oiled machine type of yeah. mentality. And if there's nothing else that I've heard from how the Saw franchise has worked from its inception till like even today with Jigsaw coming mm-hmm. out, it, it's it's that they have a formula. They're going to come in and they're going to work be done at a certain time and just kind of pick it up. And for a franchise yeah. that was so consistent for so long, in fact, to this day, I don't think any franchise in that that concept, obviously we have Marvel now who's kind of picking up mm-hmm. the wings and doing so many movies a year, but uh, like that, one every single year, just kind of through the skin of our teeth type of situation. It's yeah. amazing to hear that that's the case, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean it was you know it was clever filmmaking. It really was. Mm-hmm. So and like even the very first one, I always say to people, you know, because as soon as you finish, you know, as soon as we finished working on the Saw franchise, I would go to meetings in Los Angeles, and and I felt like I was only getting the meeting because people wanted to find out what the Saw formula was. What was the secret? You know, what was the secret formula? And the secret formula was basically that everyone was kind of smart about it. You know, um, James and Lee came up with a great idea in that first movie, and. And they were, it's like they went to film school and they actually listened to everything and did everything right. You know, don't blow your brains out with, you know, too big a, too big a movie in your first one, but, you know, make it a really good story. Um, you know, limited locations, uh, you know, relatively no name cast, don't, you know, don't go for like giant stars in your first movie. Um, tell a damn good story and have a great twist, you know, and they just, they did everything right, you know? <laughs> They, they and that's lucked, why it was successful. They lucked yeah. out on Tobin Bell. I got to admit, like, I think oh, everyone sh- thinks yeah. that. <laughs> but, oh, for sure. Uh, yeah, for sure. Tobin's amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and so, you know, as you already alluded to and just want to get in there, unless there's anything that you want to talk about no. with Saul 3, because I know I'm forgetting something and I'm going to get people in the comment section below. Oh, you should have asked him about this. And I'm going to you know, <laughs> hit myself in the head. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, when it comes to the fourth film, uh, there was these rumors uh, around the same time, because you remember back mm-hmm. in those days, the internet and the blogosphere was really kind yep. of heating up. And there was yeah. these rumors, uh, reports from various sources that you were going to be directing the fourth film. And yep. especially after the ending of Saw 3, that <clears throat> really got a lot of people's attention. How are they going to continue yep. this story? It's crazy. And then uh, as far as everyone else is aware from what we got heard is, you know, Darren came back because he wanted to do Repo. And he said as much in his commentary for Saw 4 that you yeah. know, he, he wanted to do this. This was something that was a passion project for him. And so he made a deal with them, and they were willing to make that deal. Uh, and I'm a, you, know, you worked with him very closely on both of those films. So, yeah. I mean, was there a relief there? Or was it like, oh, I mean, I'll get the next one type of thing that actually did happen? It, it was actually, you know, it was uh, unfortunately a little, more, a little more tragic than that. Oh. Um, what happened is... Um, you know, the producers had called to, you know, they, we had been talking about me doing Saw 4 for mm-hmm. the whole year. Darren adamantly did not want to come back for Saw 4. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and of course, I was very excited about doing Saw 4. You know, it was going to be my first feature film as a director. And um, the day they called to make the, uh, the solid offer um, was exactly one hour after we found out my wife had cancer. Oh. And... Um, so, like, I'm literally standing there in a snowstorm holding her lunch while she's getting a bone marrow sample taken out of her hip. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I get this call from the producers and and um, and I'm just like, yeah, listen, I got to call you back, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and then over the next few weeks, um, we you know, it, it was clear that that was not a good idea for me to direct this movie, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and the people at Lionsgate and 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 Twisted Pictures mainly um were so amazing they actually said tell you what why don't you take care of your wife take care of your family um right now you can um you can production design soft four and so we'll support you all through that so you can come and go to the hospital as you need and um and then what we're going to do is offer you to production design repo genetic offer after that and then you can direct soft four or soft five and soft six mm-hmm. um and they said, like, we're guaranteeing you two and a half years of work, which is unheard of in the film business. And they did. Um, and uh, and it worked out great. And it was really, you know, the most amazing thing. And, you know, my wife recovered and, and um, you know, is uh, is perfect today. And um, 
you know, so it was really a wonderful thing for my family and, and, you know, kind of, it's funny how the universe kind of does things like that. <laughs> um, it's, it's crazy. And you look back and you just go, wow, I can't believe it. At the time it felt so devastating. And yet in, in hindsight, you know, it was just like the universe taking care of us. Oh. So it was cool. So Darren, uh, Darren saw the opportunity, you know, and he, he said, well, look, if you want me back, um, I'll do it, but you have to you have to do my other movie as well, Repo. Mm-hmm. And so they all agreed, and you know, Repo was a good movie. It was it was lots of fun, and uh, uh, it, it's it's one yeah. of my it's one of my favorite musicals. But I, yeah, I, I had never heard any of that before, and, and thank you for sharing. Wow, that's yeah. that's a uh, that's quite a story, honestly. Yeah. Um, By the way, you want to hear something really ironic? Yes. Um, my wife's cancer was in her um, in her right foot, in her ankle. And um, she had to have an amputation, exactly the same amputation of uh, of uh, the guy in Saw One. Oh, uh, Doctor Gordon! Wow, Doctor Gordon, that, isn't that wild? Oh, yeah. yeah Carol, so, like, holy um... shit! That's that's ironic. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. But but um, absolutely crazy. Absolutely. Yeah. Insane. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, like such an interesting story. Like I said, never heard anything like that but uh no one's ever talked about that or at least that i've found so thank you for yeah. sharing yeah uh, and and i you know the other thing too is that the guys from lionsgate uh, peter block and and the gang and and mark berg and 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 uh dan hefner and the and the whole team um actually bought my wife her first prosthetic leg oh. which was really very touching oh, wow. you know, very nice yeah it was really a family really a, a great amazing family so See? See, see, for me, with with the Saw franchise in particular, and how Lionsgate has really grown up over the years, and Twisted Pictures as well, and everything, I, I I've just always had such a soft spot for them, uh, yeah. because they they kind of, you know, be it all for a bit. This is a business, and not really uh, anything else like that. It just always felt like the Saw family and everything that went into making those movies every single year was something very special. And this, yeah. this is something that just really proves it. And one of the reasons I've always loved both those companies and all the work that they do. So yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for sharing. But you know, when it comes to Saw 4 and also Repo, I would love to talk about that as well. Cause I said, like mm-hmm. I said, it's, it's just one of my favorite, it's just a silly little rock opera. And if anyone's listening to this, who hasn't seen Repo, just do yourself a favor and go watch it. it it's an interesting film. Uh, uh, but yeah. that that must have been, outside of all of that other stuff that you just talked about, an interesting uh, kind of callback and bring everything back when you thought that Saw 3 was going to be the last one, but you can't stop when your third film has just made $160 million or something at the box office or whatever yeah. it did. And so uh, they bring you all back. How on earth, you know, how the hell are we going to tell this story and how is it going to be done? Uh, and it, it is, it, and also, uh, you know, Patrick and, uh, Patrick and Marcus can come on to start writing. Yeah. Uh, Lee, mm-hmm. uh, Lee Winnell, he, he's done. Uh, how is that transition? Did that cr- cause any hiccups for y'all? <laughs> um, it, it was, uh, soft four was definitely one of the hardest ones to pull together, uh, because of that, because we, we kind of like, we knew it was going to happen, but. Um, you know, now Jigsaw's dead. I mean, you know, um, he, he's dead and what are we going to do? He's, he's, you know, what do we do with this guy? Now we have to, of course, do, you know, all kinds of devices, find all kinds of devices to, to explain the story and where it's going. And, you know, as soon as you know that Jigsaw is dead, as all Saw fans would at this point, they also have in their mind, you know, oh, they're just going to do a flashback now or, you know, or maybe they're just faking it or, you know this sort of thing and it's it was really hard it was a really hard story to pull together and um that was that was certainly the most difficult season to pull to pull it around you know to bring it back um you know darren's darren had a, a reluctance to being there until until you know the deal was made um and so you know that was that you know, it's one thing to have saw three where darren was fired up and like just roaring to get in there mm-hmm. and then saw four where you know it was there was a little a little hesitation um so it um yeah i mean i it was um it was something that that was a super challenge for everybody plus you know by this point we had made so many traps 
you know, making the traps was, was always a challenge because like, how do you do yourself? You know, how do you make something better than last year? And, and, uh, so that alone was always, you know, the biggest thing every year for us, the biggest, hardest challenge. I mean, uh, the one thing about Saul 4 that always stands out to me is the reliance on not showing anything and not even really alluding to anything that was happening in Saul 3. And I have to admit, the first time I saw it, I was like, what the hell is going on? Especially when <laughs> uh, you start intertwining it with the ending of Saul 3 and yep. and everything plays out the way it does. Of course, you have uh, Costas Mandalore come back. He was briefly introduced in Saul 3. Uh, I don't yep. even think I, as a big of a fan as I was, like I barely noticed that the first yeah. time. Like I've seen him before, but he didn't really even have much lines. Uh, but <laughs> he, he comes in. Yep. And everything kind of comes together. And I think that, even though I was already a fan, uh, everything in that, that movie is the, the one reason I just absolutely will never give up on this franchise. It, it, it's, not, it's not the best one, as I already said. The best one, in my yep. opinion, is the third. But it's so unbelievably crazy. And it sets the stage for something so special in the last couple films of the franchise that it's it, it's... How did they do this? They got me. Uh, I wasn't going to see this all taking place at the same time type of twist. And yeah. and all these characters and just waiting to see what happens next. It was, it was interesting. And I remember seeing it with my friends opening night. And then we just stood outside the theater for probably like two hours. You know, like stupid little teenagers uh, have nothing to do on a Friday night. Just discussing it, the whole thing, yeah. like what just happened. <laughs> Here's something, you know, what was interesting about that too was that part of how that story developed and part of, you know, I mean, it, this, it started with the fans, I have to say, that fans were asking questions like, how the hell does a guy with brain cancer who's, you know, in this decrepit state, how does he pull together these traps, mm -hmm. you know? And of course, you know, we felt like, you know, we, we need to address that. We we also need to look at, you know, what are the rules of our universe? I mean, does this guy just go down to the hardware store and pick up a, you know, pick up a blade and go, oh, that'll be nice, you know, and I'll <laughs> use that, you know, uh, does he order it from Amazon? You know, what's he doing here, you know? How, how does he get these traps together? Because some of them are pretty, just pretty big and this sort of thing. So we said, well, he's he's got help. He's he Someone is helping him. And that's, you know, and that's where that really started to develop that. You know, eventually we know it developed into there's a lot of people helping him. You know, he's had help from different directions and, you know, and, uh, you know, that may go on for ages. And and it was also, um, you know, people were looking at it going, well, you know, this is a good direction for this to start to move in that that it's not just Jigsaw doing this by himself. Um, so, uh, you know, and and, you know, it had so many great possibilities on people emulating Jigsaw and, and this kind of thing. Um, so that was really something that, that was brought on by the fans, if anything, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I, I, mean, I, I just remember, uh, there was this ad campaign for the fourth one. I don't know if you remember this. Uh, there's various things that I remember from back in the, you know, like, heck that was 11 years ago. What happened yeah. to time? Uh, and, and so I, there was this trailer and the Saw franchise has never been one for, spoilers with the yeah. trailer. I mean, it's very, very sparse uh, yeah. information, especially when it comes to Saul 5 and the trailer that was there mm -hmm. uh, with the cube trap. But it was what the hell is on the tape? Uh, because yeah. in the third film, we get this glimpse of John pouring all of the, uh, the wax on this little tape, Play Me, and yeah. he swallows it, or at least we get an idea that he swallows it. And you're like, okay, what the hell is on that tape? And that's the one thing they really harked on that entire movie and that entire ad campaign. And it, yeah. it, it just worked. It, it worked because, you know, even though the fans love the character and they're like, like you said, how is he doing this? I remember back yeah. on House of Jigsaw days, uh, he, this idea that he has these people helping him and that he's somehow, you know, the puppet master from beyond the grave and the discipline from the entire creative team, all of y'all going, we're not going to go the bad route. 
You know, it's yeah. believable that somebody, especially someone in the police force, might be helping him. It's unbelievable that he faked his death or that somehow he's haunting or anything else like that. Yeah. We've already created our world. We have our character who's going to yeah. – uh, who's just that smart. And and, yeah. and and that's one of the best things about Saul 5 too. And we'll get there. Yeah. But uh, he's just that smart. And this is the type of person we're working with. And and Saul 4, I think, was the, the, the setup for that, for the remainder of the franchise. And I think it really plays very well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For and, sure it did. Yeah. So, so when it comes to, uh, but also around that time, like we said, you're working on Repo. Uh, what was your experience there? Well, Repo was a, a, obviously a very different animal, um, but a lot of the same, a lot of the same production team, certainly. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, you know, it's, it's funny because I'm, I, my family jokes about how much of, of, of a non-fan of musicals I am. <laughs> um, and so for me to be working on this musical was, was pretty crazy. Um, and, and yet it was so creative, I, I couldn't resist it. You know, I mean, I, it was absolutely something I wanted to do. You know, as I said, I, I love working with Darren. Uh, we have a great working relationship, and and we're good friends. And and uh, you know, when he started telling me about this thing, I was just like, "That's that's whacked." Like that is, you know. And of course, the only reference I have for that really is was the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Mm -hmm. You know, and and um, so I was going, "This is going to be amazing." You know, and then he starts, you know, pulling out names like Paris Hilton, and I'm like, "What?" <laughs> you know, that's that's crazy. It's just like it's wild, and and. Um, so, you know, um, Anthony Stewart head and I was I'm going, this is going to be fantastic. This is going to be absolutely fantastic. Um, so we just started collecting all kinds of visual reference, pulling things together from, you know, everything from like Italian operas to, you know, circuses and and, uh, you know, horror movies, of course. And uh, and it just all came together so beautifully. And the sets were quite spectacular. You know, they were really really fun to design and build um tony iani who was the art director on on many of the saw movies and became the production designer after that um tony and i were really i think at our high point working together and you know my career changed when i started working with tony he's he's so good and you know finally as my wife said finally you've got somebody who is as dedicated to their to their work as you are and so it sort of just was sort of like having two of me there we could do far more and and far have far more fun with our creativity um and you know tony is a beautiful illustrator himself and and uh so i think you know combined we were able to just you know make it really visually stunning mm -hmm. yeah wow the it's yeah it's just it, like i said already these that movie in and of itself is just so interesting it, it, yeah visually just kind of weird and wacky you're right like the rocky horror picture show is a, a great uh kind of benchmark for it and i first time i saw it i was just blown away i thought oh man this is going to be a cult classic and the thing is, yeah. is it, it even though it kind of is in various circles around the web and everything i just don't feel like it got the love that it really deserved just because of how unique it is in its own yeah. right yeah yeah but i'm i'm like you know, it is as you as you probably know, it is as big as Rocky Horror Picture Show ever was, mm -hmm. and uh, to the point that like there's fans all over the world that still dress up and do do showings just like they used to do with the Rocky Horror Picture Show everywhere, mm -hmm. and um, you know fans who know all the songs and get up on stage while the movie's playing and sing along, and you know it's it's amazing. It's like it blows my mind. Right. I, I wish I, I haven't seen yeah. anything. I haven't seen anything like that. You know, they still do the Rock, Rocky Horror Picture Show here in Houston, but they mm -hmm. don't do Repo. I would I would jump at a Repo, especially a midnight showing of Repo with full of fans. Yeah, uh, I, I've done yeah. I've done the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I I've done that. Yeah. Been there, done that. Uh, but yeah. you know, you've uh, had meatloaf and toast <laughs> in your hair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, the thing is, uh, I want to go back a little bit to uh, Saul 4 because as you mentioned before and I just wanted to point this out because I don't know how many people know this and I think it's uh, just absolutely fascinating I don't know how y'all did it and every time I watch the movie I'm kind of my jaw drops with just the amount of work that must have gone into it and the exhaustion but the way that Darren decided to film it I don't know if it was Darren or just a group effort 
with the continuation shots, I mean, the, the cutting without cutting, and it's all completely 100% practical of going yeah. from one set to another so effortlessly. And it just, the film itself looks like it's gliding. You know, that was, you know, that came from, that came from certainly a collaboration with Darren and myself. And, and um, uh, you know, we're not, you know, certainly we weren't the film, first filmmakers to do it. I mean, uh, a movie, Red Rock West, that came out years ago, just did it brilliantly where they move from one one shot to the next back and forth or one scene to the next back and forth in, in real time. Mm -hmm. And um, and then that first movie that I production designed with Saul Rubinick, Jerry and Tom, uh, we did all these live transition shots moving from moving through time and space uh, from one scene to the next uh, seamlessly. These, you know, and and the second movie I did with Saul, same thing. And Darren had seen those and um, and really quite liked them. And said, you know, that's a great way for us to, a great thing for us to bring to this to this movie, and uh, so we we went through a lot of um, a lot of research and and uh, you know sat there for long hours designing those really meticulously, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm glad you pointed that out because those were really fun, yeah, um, and I I really think they made the movie you I, know, as a as a nice visual style. I I think I just remember. And it's 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 so fun to listen to. If anyone who hasn't, uh, who has or hasn't, I would tell y'all go listen to the director's commentary if you could find it with Darren on four, because he does take a lot of time to promote and talk about Repo. I think y'all were doing yeah. that like at that point, so like it was just so yeah. fresh in his mind. He wanted to talk oh, about yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But he he just goes off on he just goes off on this mini rant about this one particular shot in Saul 4, which I think is, is absolutely brilliant, but he said, you know, nobody got it. I, he's, like, so mad that nobody would understand it and it would confuse audiences, which I think it does, and <laughs> I've talked to people who it confuses. But there's this shot, uh, completely 100% practical, it's crazy, where uh, I think Betsy Russell is laying in the bed. <laughs> She's laying in the hospital bed as Tobin is right next to her. He gets up, he throws away this watch that he's made for his uh his their their newborn after it's yeah. passed and 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 he gets up and he walks over and in the meantime once you stop focusing on her she runs into the set while she's in the interrogation room with Scott Patterson. Yeah. And John's character is silhouetted watching it. And and he and he goes into this rant about how no one understood how he was sitting there watching it, and that they had to take it out or something like they there was such a fight with it or something, and it, it's just it, it's hysterical. I don't know if that's there's more story to that, but it just always stands out in my mind. To be very honest, you know what? I don't even remember that. I don't even remember <laughs> the. Sh I rem I partly remember the shot, and I remember you know us going. How are we going to transition from this one? location to the other and 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 that but uh but honestly i'm you know yeah. i wish i could tell you more about that well, like i said, <laughs> I have to like, watch it again it, it's like 11 years ago yeah it, it, it's crazy yeah. and like i said i was I, I was um kind of doing my my research to get ready for this interview and i just thought that that's such a unique little uh shot especially when it kind of coalesces to everything else that happened in that f yeah. that film because it so effortlessly goes from past to present to future or whatever yeah that's going on but i want to jump in now to, to the big fish in the sea uh with this conversation with your work on Saul five and there's so mm -hmm. much i mean just in general to talk about when it comes to this film uh yeah and 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 if you don't mind me saying I, before we started talking, before we did this recording, I told you, you know, I really think that you get such a bad rep from the community uh, when it comes to this film because there's so much that works in it and there's so much character development. Yeah. And like I said earlier, the traps and everything that went into making these this film, it just, it's the grand opus of what Saul was. I mean, the characters, uh, the introduction of the real introduction of uh, Casas Mandalore's Mark Hoffman's character yeah. uh, in, yeah. in such a big way and going back kind of like Saul three on steroids. And you better remember everything that happened, you know, four years ago, <laughs> everything that happened or you're not going to understand this. I mean, that I think uh, was the breaking point film for a lot of fans. Look, yeah, I mean, look, I, I appreciate you, you know, acknowledging that that. You know, it was not as loved a film as uh, I had wished it would be. Um, but I think that one of the problems with it was 
exactly um, exactly what you just explained that you have to kind of have been keeping score you know you you almost <laughs> needed to go back and go wait what what, what happened you know it's it's always better when a film even you know as a sequel can stand alone i mean you know the, and and i know that darren was always adamant about that making sure that the films felt like they could stand alone um in in his uh i can say that that was probably a mistake in mine you know but you know to that to that effect i mean i have at that point you have so little to do it's a machine that runs itself mm -hmm. kind of you know between Lionsgate and and the Twisted Pictures producers and the writers and myself and and uh, you know we're kind of going okay what you know what do we have left in this story universe to talk about what do we have left to do you know Jigsaw is dead we kind of went over that you know in Saw Four we're now working with a little bit of a dead horse here or certainly a dying one mm -hmm. and you know how do we freshen this up how do we keep it going how do we uh, you know, build for the future of this franchise. And, you know, are we going to make this the final one? We don't know, you know. And so I can definitely say that that it was really hard in the writing process to, um, uh, you know, to build on something new and to create something new because all we have left is flashbacks sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. All we have left is this, you know, is telling the audience, yes, Jigsaw did have help, you know, and here's how it all worked out, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and here's, you know, here's who, who was helping him and, and, uh, perpetrating these traps. So, uh, that of course becomes really, it can become really clumsy. Um, you know, the traps are traps in the sense that, you know, we just had to, you know, we just had to do some great traps and, and, you know, then stick the story around that. Um, so I was really, you know, I, I was really fond of all the traps in that one. Uh, certainly. Um, but it's those scenes where we have to explain more, you know, the scenes where we have to say, you know, here's how Jigsaw and, and cost and Jigsaw and, and, um, Hoffman. and, uh, Hoffman, you know, really got together and how, you know, where the relationship started and, you know, what got him fired up and, and how did he, how was he recruited and all of this kind of thing. So, um, it's, you know, Certainly, that was hard. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not one to say that it, it wasn't, and it, it, I, the movie itself, and I have to, I wanted to kind of go into this and tell you my experience watching it for the first time because I think it mm -hmm. was, I, to this day, I think it was one of the most special movie theater experiences I've ever found. Uh, as I already mentioned, very big fan since the beginning. I mm -hmm. believe, and I don't know how wide this was, but at least in my theater, they had a special. They were going to show all five in, in a row. Oh, great. And yeah. leading up to the midnight premiere of Saul 5. And they did the same thing for Saul 6, but this was, this was just amazing. This is just like an yeah. eight-hour experience, uh, sitting down, watching it, and then it got, gets to Saul 5. And seeing all of that together, I, yeah. I'll just never forget it because you see the, the beginnings – you know, the death and the third film and all the craziness with the fourth and leading up to the explanation of what's going on all in a row for the very first time. Uh, didn't have to go like watch them on my own one at a time or whatever. Yeah. And, and, and that's one of the reasons I actually really like this film uh, when it comes to certain Saul sequels. There's just so much in there that aren't in other films. And like you said, the showing how uh, Costas and Tobin came together and when exactly that happened in the timeline and why uh, and also just building uh, Hoffman's character to be the person who's going to shepherd uh, shepherd this uh, franchise going forward I, there's just yeah. there it, it, it works uh, that isn't to say that it's flawless uh, none of them are flawless uh, <laughs> the, the the one question I wanted to ask and I'm sure people who are big fans uh who who would like to know this just as a fun little question uh the title card what was what was that mm -hmm. about <laughs> uh it, it it becomes so it was hardcore you know from that point on we had saw saw too and it's just this grungy uh kind of liquid or very slow moving thing but then it's like saw five like boom i don't know uh was that <laughs> is there a story behind well, that or it, it was um you know let's put it this way i wasn't that big a fan of the title card but um 
where I mean, I I had hoped it was going to be more elegant than that. Mm. Uh, that's all. Um, <laughs> oftentimes, these things come down to just like how much money and time have we left? You know, yeah. <laughs> not much. And okay, let's get something in there. But um, not that it was not that it was completely thoughtless. But uh, I had really wanted it to play on on the neck trap idea, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, when I when I designed that neck trap. Um, you know, the, 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 the V cut in that thing, of course, is, was supposed to be, you know, I was, I wanted to slam into that thing or, or something that looked like that. Mm -hmm. I wanted the poster art to be like that. I mean, but it's, it's hard to, it's hard to get better than the promotional work on the Saw franchise. And I really think that, that the promotional work on, on the Saw franchise has been the best I've seen on any movie franchise. And Lionsgate has this great marketing department, like just, you know, Tim Palin is really the god of marketing as far as I'm concerned. And in the sense that he he has designed and in some cases even shot himself the uh, posters and all the, um, you know, all that material for promotions of the Saw franchise. And, um, you know, I was hoping that <laughs> I was hoping that uh, that that V would give him a thing to riff on, you know, mm -hmm. that neck trap. Um, and it didn't quite get there. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> but, um, it was, it was kind of funny. I mean, it was like, I, I watched it myself the first time. I didn't, I actually didn't approve that. I was like, I'd never <laughs> first saw it before it went up. I was just kind of like, what? Oh, well, you know, <laughs> it, you know, it's done. It's done. Fair enough. Right. Yeah. It, so I apologize for the, for that, <laughs> but, you, um, it should have had more blood on it. That's all. <laughs> just, I, I, yeah. I'll say this. You don't have to apologize for anything in that movie. I, I really think even though a lot of people like it's don't have the highest of opinions for it, I, I really certainly do. And I think most people listening to this do as well, uh, because of what it gave us for the franchise. Uh, Sure. As, as you know, moving on from that though, I think it's uh, something that a lot of people might not know. Although I think the special on this was on the Blu-ray and DVD releases for Saw Five. Mm -hmm. uh, the main marketing material for the film was the Cube Trap. Yeah, and Scott, Scott Patterson's character in there. There's a lot of story behind that, which I would love for you to go into because of how much work that went into it and and what sure. that meant for the final trap as well. But uh, the the inspiration I think a lot of people don't know and how that that was actually kind of brought up. I want. Uh, would you mind sharing that story? Yeah. That was great. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, as as you and I talked a little bit before this interview, um, my my son Sean, uh, who was probably I guess he was probably like ten years old at the time. Um, we were we were at home and uh, there was this little plastic cube that had um, when we gave our dog. Her Christmas presents that year mm -hmm. it was all in this little plastic container this little plastic box and as I'm trying to come up with trap ideas uh, I saw this thing and I was like hey Sean come here <laughs> and so my son my son comes into the dining room and I, I turn the lights out and I said here hold this flashlight under your chin and put this plastic cube on your head and he's like what <laughs> and I said just just do it and I you know took my cell phone out and I I moved in on the on that thing and and um uh, and then I just started riffing on it and and um, developing this idea for for someone whose head is in this cube and they wake up in this in this cube. You know, I mean, the wake up rooms have always been one of the most fun parts about the Saw franchise. You know, in, in each in each movie that, you know, they wake up somewhere somehow in some kind of a position or a restraint. And I thought this could be really nice to have just like this scene open where you see this light come on and it's in this box and and then someone's head's in there and then they realize that everything is cap or their, their head is captured but nothing else in their body is captured in this thing and then you eventually reveal what this trap is and the fact that that it's going to fill with water mm -hmm. and uh and then he has to make a most bizarre escape um <laughs> that trap was very very difficult to to engineer and to to design because again as i said it, it had to be safe as well as it had to look deadly um as it turned out, it was actually one of the most dangerous saw traps we've ever done. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was because, uh, you know, it had the potential for someone to drown. You know, you had to have this, we had to have this gasket around uh, Scott Patterson's neck and to, so the water wouldn't drain out. But at the same time, he had to be able to escape quickly. Um, 
we designed it so that the front and the back could open very, very fast. He could do it himself. He could just like flip these little levers on the side. If you look, there's these little tiny tabs on the side that if he, if he needed to, he could use it. He could do it himself. And we had safety people just like literally arm's length off camera on both sides so that if they saw that something was wrong, they could jump in and, and release the water and then pull Scott out. But one of the problems for Scott was that he's sitting on the stool and you can't compress your spine, you know, so <laughs> he, he had to keep his head up in there. So he had to keep his back very straight all day long. When we we're filming this thing. And of course, his head is slightly tilted back at a point. And when we're doing the first few takes and filling with water, um, when it got up to Scott's nose, he actually took on water and and began to choke and almost did drown. And, um, you know, we, we extracted him from the trap very quickly and and recovered him and but I mean, he was his his knees were shaking. He was literally uh, he was terrified. I mean, we were all terrified. You know, we're all like, holy shit, that like did that almost happen? And of course, you know, as a director, I'm also going, well, is he going to be able to continue? You know, <laughs> is he going to? Well, Scott was just such, Scott was amazing. He was such a trooper. You know, he he's like, let's do it again. Let's go. And I'm like, are you okay, Scott? Because like you do not have to do this. And he's like, no, let's do it again. And then someone came in and said, you know, the problem is we need to plug his nose. We're like, well, we don't have nose plugs. I mean, how are we going to do this? And and I think that the makeup artist goes, well, I've done a thing similar to this before. And we just stuffed Vaseline up his nose. <laughs> and so we took like a half a container of Vaseline and shoved it up for Scott's nostrils. So now he can't breathe out of his nose. You know, so as soon as the water gets past his mouth, that's it. But that allowed us to fill the thing with water so that, and he wouldn't take on water in, in his nose and uh and he performed like that all day long i mean talk about uncomfortable <laughs> you know that guy was brilliant and and uh he was such a such a trooper i gotta hand it to scott you know thank you scott if you ever hear this um you know he was stupendous and uh and i think he just took that fear and he just like brought it to the to the scene mm -hmm. you know and and that energy so yeah it was really cool that was that was a, an amazing day of filming and uh at the end of it, I think we're all just like, holy shit, we pulled that off. I can't believe it. <laughs> I, yeah. I, and, and you know what? I, I, the thing that interests me the most about that, too, is the initial idea uh, for the thing that actually kills uh, uh, Strom's character, uh, Scott Patterson's character, is yeah. uh, the crushing room. But at yeah. least the idea was we're going to replay the water trap thing and have that whole room filled with water. What? Like, what was the yeah. story about that not working? I imagine that would have been incredibly difficult. Yeah, well, I mean, that that was the thing, was that we we were originally going to do that. Um, but then when we started to explore it, I mean, it just became so difficult to do. We had to we had to find another solution for it. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, that just the volume of water was way beyond what our budget could handle. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, the safety involved and this kind of thing. I mean, to put a man actually in a, in a watertight box would have been hugely expensive and, and hugely dangerous. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we, you know, we had lots of meetings about it and we just said, we can't do this. You know, we have to find another way. Um, and you know, we could have done it with CGI, I guess, but, um, you know, we always kind of prided ourselves on doing as much as we could practically. So, um, so then it came down to this idea of, of this box actually folding into the floor and, um, and using the, the crushing wall, which we've seen, you know, the, the walls moving in many movies, you know, and, um, and, and this was something where it was just like, yeah, but this time, Let's finish it. You never like everyone, you know, every time you see the walls, you know, the compactor, the garden walls, you know, they, uh, you know, that metal or whatever it is, you know, or the switch gets turned on, you know, turned off at the right time or they somehow escape it. There's always an escape. Right. Mm -hmm. But we said, but let's not do that <laughs> for the first time in cinema history. Let's make it so, so that the crushing wall actually crushes somebody. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and part of that, you know, Part of that came down to us sitting in the edit suite trying to figure out what the ending was a couple of days, like literally two or three days before we had to present it to – before we had to present the director's cut to producers. And Peter Block was there with me, Peter Block from, from Lionsgate, and, mm -hmm. and um, the other producers were coming up in a couple of days to, to look at the movie. And, and I said, really? You know, this is, this is where the movie should end. 
it should be like like the curtain draws right here boom it comes together the problem was that of course because scott was always in inside those walls we <laughs> never actually got them fully together mm -hmm. and andrew coots who was the editor um said well i could do that in post i could like just you know close it those last eight inches for you if you want to see what it's going to look like um and i said you can do that and he's like yeah man i'll do it tonight and you know i'll do it in uh you know adobe after effects and we'll just take a look at it tomorrow so sure enough in the morning he brought that into us and we looked at it and just went that's it that's the ending of the movie right there that's the perfect thing you know um and you know we had an ending to the movie that we weren't exactly fond of um it just didn't have the power that 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 had so you know when when we saw it you know peter and i both looked at each other like that's it and that was the one we presented and that's the one that made the movie so i want to i want to jump into that immediately uh so i i don't know if this is true i don't i'm mm -hmm. working off of assumptions but in the yeah. special features for saw 5 they did have this thing yep. that we just never saw i it, it's yeah. obvious that y'all filmed it uh has yep. We don't know who else. Betsy Russell, we have the kind of an explanation for what the box yep. was and pictures in the background. And she yep. goes, I know who you are, turns around and walks away. Yep. Yep. That was the ending, I'm assuming. And and I'm, I've was. always been so curious as to what that means. And the fact that y'all, like, not y'all, but like the Lionsgate and everyone has never given us any of these deleted scenes or deleted endings that would really kind of uh, satiate my appetite for this. Like, oh, I want to know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was that was the original ending that was scripted. Um, and I think everybody when we're you know, when, when we're filming it, we're just kind of like this just doesn't have the kind of power we want for, our, you know, a saw ending. It doesn't slam the door, literally, mm -hmm. in, in this case. Uh, it, you know, we wanted it to we wanted it to be stronger. And and it just it felt like it just left too many things open, too many questions, you know, as you have. Um, you know, I think we weren't even quite sure what it was going to be or what it meant at that time. Um, and, it just and, seemed like uh, it, uh, it felt tagged on in the writing room. That's all. And, and, you know? and, and, the, and the thing that you see in the special features, and I'm not sure if this is true or not. Yep. This is just speculation back in the good old days with uh, the House of Jigsaw and everyone speculating. Uh, the idea was this is what was in the box. Yes. Yeah. Earlier on in the film, we get her receiving this box from John uh, after he dies. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we had to wait until Saul 6 to actually understand what that was. Yeah. But in the background, it looks like, you know, this dark room, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's supposed to be in connection with this, the Jigsaw 2 house that's in Saul 5, we'll get to in a bit, and mm -hmm. everything like that. But she has plastered these pictures of everyone on the wall and these bags that are hanging out from them. And I remember the biggest fan theory there was those are the puzzle pieces that have been being cut out. And no one knew what any of that really meant or anything. Do you remember what was hanging from those bags or what those pictures were or anything? Or at least just a general thought from everyone on set of what this was going to lead into? Yeah, I mean, you know, what they what they were meant to imply, uh, as I said before, was that, that there were other people out there lots of other people out there helping mm. and um and you know that this had that it essentially had spread to you know in in like you know like like things spread on the internet people had started to go oh you know i can do this i can do this stuff for jigsaw and people were joining the jigsaw army effectively mm. and um people were starting to you know do jigsaws work far and wide and um so that's that's what they were they were meant to be where all these all these people who were um you know who are also involved mm -hmm. um and uh but i can't you know god i can't remember what was in the bags um <laughs> jesus it, it looks I, like it looks like puzzle pieces but i could be wrong i mean there's just so many it's so blurry you i, get I think that, no you know what i think they were they were all puzzle pieces and and i i think that that was you know meant to imply that these people were parts of the jigsaw puzzle you know and there were there were things that we were going to use down the road um they were puzzle pieces and we we're going to use them down the road for other elements uh you know other pieces in the in the stories to come so i, I uh yeah mark berg and all them every time that they come on with their producers commentary tracks for all the movies they always just sit there i think ever since saw four maybe saw three they're just like 
we're going to figure out a reason for these stall pieces. We're going to use them again. They just haven't. And, and yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe it jumps from there. It's like, well, we got rid of that. So we have to figure out another way that this was going to make sense or this these things were going to kind of come back into the the fold. Yeah. But I, I guess they haven't. It, it's it's completely unnecessary. But that does like that does kind of make me giddy like it like what could have been but i completely agree with you the ending of saw five is absolutely perfect i mean just those closing of the of the doors and actually finishing it it, it's amazing yeah Um, yeah and i love the images of i loved seeing uh hoffman in the box with blood dripping on his face looking up and and seeing this guy getting crushed and of course we love the the crushing arm you know the way his arm breaks when he tries to put it between the walls it was that was so much fun you know, hideous oh, but fun. I, I yeah, I, I love that he, especially uh, Costas. I don't know if this was a direction from you or anything else, but there's this shot right before the doors close and everything, where he kind of looks away from everything, yeah. and it's like, yeah. oh, that's just perfect. I mean, it, yeah, because one yeah. of the things I think uh, you and him really yeah. kind of convey in that movie, and of course. Uh, one of the reasons I think it's a perfect setup for the last two films in the main series or the original run mm-hmm. is Hoffman wasn't a monster. <laughs> like, yeah. And, and he becomes a monster. I mean, yeah, a lot of that, a lot of that kind of is taken away from certain things developed in Saul 3d uh, mm-hmm. or the seventh film. But in the originally he's just this guy helping John in Saul yeah. four. And then he kind of comes in and you show this guy who, you know, he had something terrible happen to him, not unlike John and yep. he's trying to deal with it in the best way possible. But at the same time, he's more of a hostage than Amanda was. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah. And, and that scene, even though it, it's completely dialogue, no driven, it's not the thing anyone's focusing on. If you've seen the film as many times as I have, you see that shot and you can take so much character in that. Yeah. And yeah, no, I, I love that. And, and, um, you know, it just it was so great with the, you know, we just felt like, um, you know, at one point when we were doing one of the takes, uh, you know, I saw him just tweak his head a little bit. And I just went, oh, that's kind of nice. You know, it's kind of <laughs> nice that he's just like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be part of this or, you know, it kind of it kind of separated him from this horror, you know, that he's he is not a monster. If you're right. And mm-hmm. that was the cool thing about that. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, also talking about that. uh I, I want to. I want you to elaborate a little bit more, if you would, about that amazing scene. I think one of my favorite scenes in all of the franchise is just this. I believe it's seven minute long scene, and I and with the producers' commentary in Saul Five, mm-hmm. this idea that oh, we were going to cut this up. <laughs> like it, it's yeah. such a long scene between Tobin yeah. and and uh, and uh, Costas, and and it works. It it just worked like this this back and forth control power manipulation yeah. everything about that what what went into that scene and well, especially that was... <laughs> especially the, the cutting it i'm sorry no i was i was gonna say the the cool cool thing about that was is um it, it was such an important scene in the franchise um you know this is this is him setting up the wake up room from saw two right and or them setting up the wake up room from saw two and so we see all these bodies on the floor and and you see and, and as I said earlier, that the, one of the big big fan questions was, how did Jigsaw do this all on his own? Well, he didn't. You mm-hmm. know, right from the beginning, someone helped him, right? And and that's where we wanted to go with this. Um, plus, if we're going to get into flashbacks, well, let's really get into the flashbacks. <laughs> you know, let's really, you know, let's really tell this tale, right? And um, and it was I wanted to really create a sense of back and forth between these guys, and originally it was going to be a whole bunch of cuts. I mean, we we're going to cover Costas' side and Tobin's side and look around the room and this kind of thing. And the day actually started to run long in the morning. We started, we were shooting some other things in the morning and Dan Hefner came up to me just before lunch. And he said, I don't know how the hell you're going to pull off this <laughs> giant scene this afternoon. I just don't know like how you're going to be able to get all that done, you know? And if you don't get it done today, you're screwed. Right. And, um, and I started thinking about that and, I went to Tobin and to Costas and I said, will you guys give me 10 minutes at the end of lunch? Um, I'm considering doing the scene as a oneer, meaning, you know, that we start rolling and they just play it out and the camera keeps moving and, and we do it. And I went to David Armstrong and talked to him about it. And, um, 
uh, our, our cinematographer, uh, DP, and you know, we all talked it through and we said, yeah, let's do this. Right. So we went, we came back after lunch and we started to set it up. We set the whole thing up and it just, it just grew and grew into, into better and better moments. You know, we realized that, that by gluing this all together, it was just going to have this really nice fluid, uh, feeling to it where it's just like, you're, you're just looking at this, this chess game between these two men almost. And, um, you know, the only the only regret I had was, of course, that we had to cut to that shot of uh, that. I And it was my wanting, you know, <laughs> I wanted to cut to that shot of Tobin pulling that brick out and mm-hmm. looking in the hole. Right. And um, uh, but we ought, we actually did cover it from the other side where he just pulled it out. But it was just like, no, it's so much better if we look through. Right. Yeah. And that's how we you know, that's how we had designed that shot anyway. You know, we wanted that shot to be like that. So, it, you know, but it was kind of punctuation in in the scene so it actually works just fine and um we rehearsed it for probably two hours and we shot the whole thing in about 20 minutes wow. and um on you know we did multiple takes but uh but yeah shot the whole thing in about 20 minutes so we actually finished i think an hour early that day so <laughs> there you go dan hefner you know. <laughs> i i love one of the reasons i just love that scene especially with what we were talking about with hoffman's character I just love it. The dialogue in that scene is so perfect. Just, yeah. You're assuming this is going to go out the way you want. If you're good at anticipating yeah. the human mind, you leave nothing to chance. And I don't know if that. I don't yeah. know how much of that is uh, uh, Marcus and Patrick, or or just Tobin Bell himself, because the I you know the story is he embellishes yeah. and he writes a lot of his lines, but it's just so perfect. Yes. And and that's. It's, I'm saying that was that was certainly Tobin. You know, <laughs> I mean, you can you can you know when you hear when when you. When you see Jigsaw, and that's one of the things that makes Tobin such a great actor, is um, you know all all of the best actors I've ever worked with are like that. That they they understand that that their character, like they become their character, you know, internally. They they um, you know, and Tobin was fantastic at that. I mean, who there, there is no other Jigsaw. Tobin Bell is Jigsaw, and and he comes on set and just brings it. And that was him altogether. And you can hear anytime he's Anytime Jigsaw is, is pontificating, anytime he's speaking like that, you know, you know that's Tobin completely. Yeah. And it's it's the richness that Tobin brings to that oh, yeah. um, every time. Yeah, he's great. He really there, understands the character. There was uh, – I, I want. I also want to talk about the uh, shotgun collar scene. I mean that one's long yeah. and, 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 it just, and, and just such a great shot. I mean this is the first time in the entire series that we really get uh, – interaction between these two actors and i think one of the reasons everyone in the community more than i i initially thought i'm a i'm an amanda fanboy myself but uh when it comes to hoffman's character i think this is that that scene and all of these flashbacks between acostas and tobin are one of the reasons mm-hmm. everyone loves hoffman i mean just yeah. the, the amount of character and dialogue he gets with tobin and how yeah. their their perspectives kind of jump off each other i mean the, the shotgun collar scene uh where he's talking about you know this seth baxter guy who killed his sister and he's taken yeah. revenge in the same way that john and john does it and it's it just that's another scene it's not cut it it just it it allows itself to play out in the same way and for for you and everyone else involved is another scene in that entire movie that just i guess punctuates not only how strong that y'all believed and it, the Saw franchise is, but how strong it is where you don't have to rely on traps. You don't have to do yeah. the, the – uh, you don't have to do the Friday the 13th thing where you have a kill every eight minutes type of thing. You you could just have yeah. these two powerhouse actors you know, just jumping off of each other for seven whole minutes. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, look, I'm – you know – I'm a big fan of movies that that uh, allow people to talk. Look, the British, the British are fantastic at uh, at drama, and and uh, you know you look at any of the great British TV shows or movies, and and you're really leaning into the story mostly when two people are talking, not when you see some kind of giant spectacle, a car chase, an explosion, or you know a murder or something like that. But actually, when two people are talking face to face, and and two actors are are delivering lines that are so true to their character and and so rich and so 
um, so completely filled with story that you're you're just sitting there on the edge of your seat almost and creating more tension and more drama than you could with an action sequence right mm-hmm. um, and and that's what I had really hoped that was going to be and um, and you know I think it did I think to a great extent you know you're you're leaning in there going wow this is you know this is a, an intense moment between these two guys mm-hmm. so um, and I you know I, I very much like that scene you know was was there was there uh was there hope because there was reports that were talking about like y'all were trying to sometime in production get Danny Glover back to reprise his role and I always wondered whether there was any thought of getting Shawnee Smith back in there if y'all were going to do flashbacks and that just didn't work out or if the, is there any story back uh, on either of those sides um you know I. Yeah, we. I mean, I think we would all love to have Shawnee Smith back. You know, she's she's great. You know, mm-hmm. she's she really. I loved, I loved Amanda's character and and the role she played in the story. I mean, um, um, as I recall, I think there was. I think there was there was either there was a timing thing that she, uh, we had a problem with for her. Um, you know, she was on another production or something like that. I don't really recall what the what the actual um, events were around it. But, um, you know, I know that, uh, I, I think it was pretty much like a timing thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that's it. And Danny Glover, I mean, there was reports that Danny Glover back. Yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't, um, wasn't so aware of the Danny Glover thing. Uh, it would be nice to have him back. Certainly it would. Um, I don't know how we would do that. (laughs) No, of course, uh, you know, we create more backstory and, you know, that, that sort of thing but i don't know that his character had enough in the front end you know in in the first one i don't think that we had said enough about him in the first one to mm-hmm. uh you know to be able to, to make it easy to come back anyway mm-hmm. if he did so. uh, of course uh, you know the the thing that uh really kind of gets me the, the the in in cell five uh there's certainly some things that don't mash up like every franchise, especially one that tries to be like this, but you have to kind of keep recreating the wheel, really. You have to keep explaining how this is working, Uh, especially in this franchise. It's just crazy. It's bonkers, and and it works. It's crazy that it works is really the main thing. But uh, there's a scene in the beginning, and I don't know if this was your original thought because you were kind of talking about how, you know, uh, Scott's trap with the whole water cube thing kind of – at least in your mind was the opening trap. And I don't know if that was true when you were, pre- mm-hmm. when you were making it, but it starts off with the pendulum trap, which to this day yeah. is just the coolest trap. I mean, it, it really just goes there and it's brutal yeah. and it, it's just overly fun to watch. Perfect way to start the franchise or the, this, the movie off. But as the film plays out, uh, you know, it becomes incredibly important to not only the film, and the relationship between John and Hoffman's character, mm-hmm. but also somewhat of his downfall and the thing that kind of does make him a monster and makes him do yeah. monstrous things in the sixth film. Um, yeah. But me as a fan, I've never really understood this, and maybe this goes into what y'all thought the thought the film was going into before you China mm-hmm. chose the ending that you did, and something would have been explained in other films, uh, mm-hmm. is chronologically it doesn't make sense because we only get Cecil and then the next trap in the chrono uh, the 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 uh story is the Seth trap so we don't have Billy yeah. at any point during that time skip besides things that we don't know of and it's always just kind of bugged me does that was that something that <laughs> y'all realized going into it or was that something y'all were like okay we'll explain it away later yeah i think i think more the latter um <laughs> You know, of, of course, I mean, the pendulum trap was supposed to be, uh, you know, was was Hoffman going off the rails a little bit, you yes. know, Hoffman going too too far, you know, killing somebody who, you know, who did what he was supposed to do mm-hmm. and um, and and yet still killing him, you know, being uh, and, and, you know, kind of saying that that he's breaking the rules. Hoffman is now breaking jigsaw's rules here right um and and, uh so i think you know i think certainly after 
you know, we looked at it and kind of went, well, I'm not sure this works out in the chronology necessarily, mm-hmm. <laughs> but but it was just so damn cool we couldn't resist it. Oh, it's, <laughs> so, it's yeah, especially especially uh, how y'all y'all figured out how to do that scene. I mean, uh, if you want to <laughs> if you want to elaborate on that, but just. It, it looks so yeah, yeah. it looks so bloody good, and the way that y'all pulled it off is just fantastic. Yeah, well, that was you know that's a classic example of the entire saw team pulling together, and um, our our prosthetics guy Francois Dejeuner, who did all the saw movies. Mm-hmm. Francois is is brilliant when it comes to bodies and um, making that body. Uh, of course, you know our 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 guy. Um, uh, Joris Jarski is actually in the actor is actually in the table underneath, of course, and he's got this prosthetic body on this this torso that at the beginning of the scene, of course, is the full body. And and it took hours to like marry that perfectly into his chest and his shoulders. And then there's people off camera with like breathing tubes that are blowing the chest up and down as it goes. There's people who are making the stomach rise. And then off the bottom, there's people puppeteering the legs. So so his legs are moving. And it looks like it really is his body all the way through, but it's not, <laughs> you know, it's not ever his, his full body. And um, so, you know, as it progressed, you know, he had to be in that box for a long time. And it was a, it was a very big morning of shooting to begin with. We, we ended up shooting that actually took about a day and a half to shoot the whole thing. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, at lunchtime, you know, we're, all, we're just feeling great because we got all the way through the body as we wanted to. You know, got the pendulum all the way through, and just this like big giant pendulum that had to be built over the top that Jason Ale built, and and you know the art department and the construction department and everybody. You know, it worked really, really well. Mm-hmm. And um, um, and uh, and Tony Iani, of course, was the production designer and and mm-hmm. designed this the, this beautiful set and. Um, at lunch, you know, we turn the studio lights on. We're like, okay, great, everyone, that's lunch. We'll be back in an hour. We're feeling wonderful. We walk off set, and we hear, we hear yours from over in the second. Hey, hey! <laughs> I guess everybody kind of thought that somebody else would take him out of the box, and <laughs> and here's the actor stuck in the box with this torso married onto him that had taken so long to put on. We had to go back and go, shit, we can't let him get out of this this torso at lunch. So. So yours had to sit there with this torso with the guts all hanging out the bottom of it on his lap while he's eating lunch, you know, and he's just it, like it was the most ridiculous thing. You can bet everybody went and took a picture of that. Um, it was so funny looking, though. I mean, that was just classic. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, of course, we forgot our guy, you know. That's crazy. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it was it was a, it was really funny and, and just a, a crazy, a crazy day, of course, you know. Um, as they always are on the trap days. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I, uh, you know, when it comes to the the rest of the franchise, I mean, Saw Five, like I said, it, uh, you know, the one one of the things I definitely remember outside of that initial experience and everything, you know, from what was it? It, it opened like the first one opened in third place, like. 18 million or something this yeah. is off the top of my head so don't <laughs> i i'm, a, I'm sure. a big i'm a big numbers guy when it comes to movies but uh, <laughs> it, it opened like 18 million or something and the second film like you said just what what the hell happened you know like oh yeah. my god like this this is resonating and mm-hmm. and the third film as well the fourth film continues the third film or the, 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 the fifth film uh really surprisingly i think really continued it as well uh, a 30 million dollar opening weekend which i'm sure yeah was ecstatic yeah. especially for you and, oh my god yes 31.7 million yeah yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and 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 the uh, but and to my to my annoyance still uh, uh not the first opening like the second uh, uh, mm-hmm. the box office that weekend because for whatever reason disney decides to do their high school musical three yeah, on that same weekend, which which also <laughs> opened big, good weekend for everybody, but still yeah. annoying to me. The one thing I remember, and I can't find it. Uh, I'm sure you don't. I don't know if you know this or remember this. Uh, don't think you had any uh, say in it. But there was this thing uh, online, and it was a promotional advertisement for Saul Five, and it's Saul Five, and the tagline for the promotional was "High schools for pussies." And I just, it, 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 I just, I absolutely love that. It was so great, and I can't find it. No one ever saved it. It's just not online anymore. I can't. 
And it, yeah. it made me laugh just because I was in, I was in a state, uh, you know, high school, uh, ending high yeah. schoolish, And I was like, this is, you know, this stupid movie is <laughs> like come out and completely tarnished, not tarnished, but kind of stepped on the, the Saul tradition. But I was still very yeah. happy with the, the opening weekend. And everyone was saying after that, that, oh man, this is guaranteeing three more films, which we eventually got. But Saul six is a completely different monster and story when it comes to the success of the franchise and where it went after. And sure. And do you want to elaborate a little bit more? Because I know, as you already said, you were kind of at some point in line to direct, not only Saul four, but you directed Saul five. We're going to direct Saul six. And then there was a very public, uh, situation with Saul seven. Uh, from yeah. behind the scenes, which I think made a lot of people uncomfortable, especially the fans, about what was yeah. going on. And uh, what what happened that allowed Kevin to come in and direct Saul 6 and your well, experience with Saul 7 as well? Yeah. Um, you know, Kevin Kevin was always a huge part of the franchise. Yes. And, you know, he, he's a brilliant editor. And, um, um, and, you know, and I know he wanted to... He wanted to direct one of them, certainly, and and rightfully so. I mean, he was such a big part of making those movies. There's there's no doubt that Kevin's um, Kevin's voice in all those stories is is loud and clear, and and um, his you know his wonderful and brilliant work as an editor uh, all the way through. You know, certainly in the in the earliest ones, in Saw Three, again, I think is some of the finest, um, and. So Kevin wanted to wanted to direct one, and um, at the same time, you know, I I had been asked to direct Saw Five and Six, and um, the producers came to me and they said, "Look, look, Kevin wants to direct one, and we want to keep him as part of this franchise. Um, how would you feel about?" It wasn't so much it wasn't so much a question. It was a, it was <laughs> it was you know them telling me, um, Kevin uh, Kevin's going to direct Saw Six. But we want you to direct Saw 7 3D. And we had always talked about how cool it would be to do a 3D movie, uh, a Saw movie in 3D. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody was like, oh, my God, these would be great in 3D. You know, just imagine these traps and, and this sort of thing. So finally, you know, we I think 3D had developed enough. The technology was there. Uh, people were becoming familiar with it enough. And there were enough theaters to make it sensible to do that. And so the Saw producers came to me and they said, we're going to employ you for the whole next year. And um, you're going to go to university or to 3D university. You know, you're going to oh, wow. you're going to learn everything there is about 3D filmmaking. So that's what we did. Um, I helped to develop the story and the traps and and all the 3D work for for um, for Saw Seven. And uh, we even on the Saw Six sets, we we took 3D cameras, different 3D systems onto the Saw Six sets and tried them out. And you know, to try to figure out what was what was the best system to use for us to film, uh, to film Saw Seven in 3D? And uh, I went down to Vince Pace's company and uh, James Cameron's partner, and uh, met with them to look at their systems, and um, you know, really, really learned everything there was. Um, then this bizarre and crazy thing happened. Of course, Saw Six, you know, Saw Six came out in the box office and. Because uh, because of Paranormal Activity, really, Paranormal mm -hmm. Activity came out, and it it kind of you know it buried Saw for the first time. Mm -hmm. I think by this point, audiences were starting to feel like um, they were getting a little a little fatigued with the torture porn thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Paranormal Activity came out, and and you know all of a sudden, horror fans, you know. Could take their their dates to to a horror movie and they weren't going to throw up in their laps mm -hmm. you know and um <laughs> they weren't going to pass out and, because of the gore and and this kind of thing they weren't going to be squeamish and so it was it was a new thing in horror and it was you know something new is always great and and the paranormal activity movies were were brilliant and and a, a brilliant concept but of course it had a really negative effect on on saw and Unfortunately for Kevin, that happened. Unfortunately for Saw and the franchise, mm -hmm. it it happened, you know, on the same day, same weekend, and and had a really detrimental effect. And and for the first time, a Saw movie didn't have a giant opening, 
the giant openings that the the others had all had. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think Kevin kind of felt like, well, maybe his time with Saw was over as well. And so he he stepped away and came up with this great idea for Paranormal Activity 2. Now, Kevin also was... Um, Kevin was credited with with really saving the first uh, Strangers movie. You know, mm-hmm. I know that they they loved his work on on the Strangers, and and he you know he was brought in as a um, you know as an emergency editor on it to um, to glue it back together. And he did a great job, and so that created a great relationship for him and Paramount. And so he went to them with this idea for for Paranormal Activity two. Uh, and said, "I'm, you know, I'd like to direct it as well." And of course, they were like, "Great, we get the, you know, we get the saw editor, and um, and we get a great story, and and um, and we're going to open on the same day as Saw Seven 3D <laughs> is coming out." <laughs> you know, so Lionsgate freaked out, of course, and um, because they know they had been crushed the year before by Paranormal Activity, and didn't want that to happen again. And they were losing their editor. They were losing. Kevin was a big part of the franchise, as, as I said, and and um, and the guys at Twisted Pictures had always been very loyal and very dedicated to to the whole team, and were very. It was very important to them to keep the team together, almost almost like on a superstitious level, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and what Kevin didn't realize is, uh, or maybe he did, but just felt like they wouldn't want him, was that he had a second picture option with. Saw guys with with twisted pictures. Mm-hmm. Um, that means that, like you know, when he signed up for Saw Six, signed his contract, they said, "And we want your second picture too." You know, um, I mean, that's a very common thing that that happens when you when you're making a movie like this because the producers are like, "Well, and if your you know your movie is hugely successful, we want your next movie as well." You know, I totally get that. I I had the same contract, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so. Lionsgate insisted that um, Twisted Pictures pull Kevin off of Paranormal Activity 2. And um, the only way Twisted Pictures could really do that was to put him on a greenlit picture. Um, and the only greenlit picture they had was my Saw 7. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, Mark called me like, I think it was maybe four, no, three days before we were going to go to camera on Saw 7. I mean, I was I was sitting in my office, working with the storyboard artist on the last the last page of all the storyboards for the whole movie, for for Saw 3D, and uh, the sets were built. We were ready to go. I mean, we were we were so close it was ridiculous. And um, and Dan Hefner comes in my office and says, Mark Berg's on the line. He's talked to you. And 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 then Dan splits. <laughs> you know, he just <laughs> and and uh, it it was it was devastating of course um you know they they bought me out which was very nice but mm-hmm. you know that's the contract but it's still not the same i mean you know a year a movie that i'd worked on for a year uh longer than i'd worked on any of the other saw movies so far was all of a sudden just like stripped away you know mm-hmm. and uh and it sucked i mean it royally sucked and it sucked most uh I think because Kevin didn't even want to be there, you know, Kevin, Kevin was like, like, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to come and do another Saw movie. You know, it's just, um, and, and I've got this great opportunity. Plus it was going to, it was going to destroy his relationship with Paramount as well. Right. Um, and the paranormal activity people. Um, I don't think that, you know, that's the case anymore. I don't think his relationship was destroyed, but, um, all around it just sucked. And, uh, so Kevin, had to parachute in and and uh, direct a movie that he didn't want to direct, um, and eventually, you know, he settled into it and did a great job. So, you know, um, it all worked out in the end. But I just it was it was just you know a tragic thing to happen to such a great franchise um, at this point, and um, and I think that it was it, it it made it really difficult for Saw Seven to be as brilliant as the other ones. You know? I, I remember, and 
I know you worked very uh, closely with everything, especially with how much work you put into it. I, I didn't know they mm-hmm. sent you to you know the the 3D film school. Was it? Did they ever approach you for an opinion? I know that they tried, or there was word that they were trying to convert Saul Six into 3D around the same time that they were releasing it, but it was just too hard. Like it, it was going to be too much oh, of yeah. a thing. No, no, we had we had talked about. Um, you know, we talked about that a lot, and and there was a lot of talk in in the world of 3D about conversions. 3D conversions were just as successful as um, you know as, as shooting dedicated 3D to begin with. Um, it just it for us, it just didn't make any sense. You know, for the Saw franchise, it didn't seem to make any sense to do that. And uh, yeah, you can have great success with it if you have tons and tons of money to do it really well. Um, you know, it just it just didn't seem like it was going to make sense for us. So, um, and it didn't add that much value. Mm-hmm. So, well, yeah. like like you said earlier, one of the things the Saw franchise has always done is just keep it keep it cheap and just recover your costs that way. I mean, I can imagine how much that conversion cost yeah. would have put on the movie to a movie that yeah. didn't make nearly as much money as its predecessors. I'm sure it yeah. was the best decision. Yeah, um, but yeah. when it comes to that the whole Saul 3 3D thing, uh, or mm-hmm. Saul 7 final chapter, whatever they're going to call it now. <laughs> uh, I don't know if they can call it the final chapter anymore, but I guess anything is, yeah. anything is fine. Uh, <laughs> so the, I mean, the original idea, or stuff that uh, Marcus and Patrick talk about, is that they had a concept for two movies. Mm-hmm. And then Saul 6 comes out, it gets kind of, just destroyed by paranormal activity which as you already mentioned was the new kid on the block my perception of it at the time was how dare this franchise this found footage franchise that has (laughs) it's it's you know those uh, my my perception of it has always been the same thing and i gave it a fair shot i i saw the first four movies or something in theaters uh on opening weekend i wanted to see what the hubbub was about but it, it it was it was feature length versions of those things on the internet where you're, they try to get you to focus before something pops out and scares you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Th- that's all it was. I mean, it's just absolute, yeah. no, it's an hour and a half of boredom and then one major scare and then that's it. And <laughs> with no real story or anything. Uh, so those, that movie comes out, takes out Saul six and I'm sure is kind of a detriment and blow to everyone working on it. Uh, they, they take these two concepts of the story and they mush them together uh, how involved were you in that? Because I know you spent a lot of time. Uh, it's been reported 21 weeks was the the prep time for that movie, uh, yeah. getting everything involved and everything kind of in place in order to do it. Uh, surely a lot of discussion about how that story came together and trying to pick and choose things that worked. Yeah, I was pretty involved in, in a lot of the story. But, um, I mean, at that point I was I was starting to – yeah, I mean, I, w- I was more involved in the uh, in the actual production of it. Mm-hmm. So, um, and and to me at that point, I was I was starting to move away from the franchise. I wasn't, you know, exactly. I, I Saw Seven was was most likely going to be the last, and at that point, and and my last, and uh, so I wasn't really paying too much attention to the the double story thing or the extended story. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, and it was. A lot of that, I think, too, was just really trying to, um, you know, trying to trying to build a, a future for the thing, you know. <laughs> so, and and as a, you know, as I said before, it was it's a hard story to continue once once Jigsaw was dead, man. It was like really difficult to say, well, what do we do? Just keep flashing back, and yeah, I guess we do, <laughs> you know. So, the prequel, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> I, so, that, that might work. Uh, and and two two more questions. I know I've kept you yeah. here for a very long time, and I incredibly appreciate it immensely. It's just been nothing but a pleasure. But uh, so you know, any thoughts you had on Jigsaw, whether you've seen it, and yeah. uh, would you come back to the franchise if they asked you? Because I, I I sure think that they could use you. As much as I did like the franchise, it just kind of feels like it doesn't have the same oomph. Well. Um... Uh, for the record, Mark Berg actually um, asked me to come back and production design Saw Eight uh-huh. um, Jigsaw. Um, unfortunately, I was I was busy 
writing a, a potential Jackie Chan movie at the time, <laughs> a big action thriller um, with a with a company from China. Um, but and I couldn't uh, because I had to get that done. Plus, developing a, a helping to develop a series called V Wars, and um, that, which is a, a new Netflix thing coming out. Um, yeah. And so I was I was just a little busy at the time and I couldn't and uh, I wish I could have. And they actually shot right in my neighborhood. My wife was walking the dog one day and she said, I think Saw is shooting down the street. Right. <laughs> and and it was actually the, the scene where the body's hanging from the from the tracks or from the bridge. Uh-huh. Um, and I walked I walked down the down the street and there they were the whole the whole Saw family. And it was it was great to see everyone. Um and, you know, I loved working on Saw. It was a great experience. It was always, um, you know, just always so much fun uh, and a great team of people. You know, you, you don't always get these fantastic teams of people where you're where everybody's dedicated to it like like they were on the Saw franchise. Um, you know, I, uh, I was happy to see that they opened up Saw a little bit, although it did start to break that vernacular that we always had out of of keeping it, keeping it contained, keeping it in the studio. And I'm not sure that it, I'm not sure that it helped, mm. you know, I, I'm not sure that it, I'm not sure that it made it better to get out of the studio and, and see the outside world that much and, and feel like it wasn't as contained. It is, once you get into the story, of course it is completely contained um, and, and pretty much shot all in studio sort of thing. Um, but um and and I did like it, although I have to admit that I felt like there were a few derivative traps, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, <laughs> there are a few traps that I guys seen parts of before. <laughs> that was the thing about the traps. You know, mm. we we went through the we went through the medieval torture traps in like the first five minutes of working <laughs> on traps and saw two. You know, then we started to get into then we started to get into more complex things and find to you know to try to find new interesting ways to mutilate and potentially kill people is not easy mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's not easy to be <laughs> to be jigsaw uh anyway yes i would i would certainly come back to the saw franchise you know entertain a whole new whole new uh realm of, of fans I, I i will let you go i'm sorry i know your your phone's about to die uh I yeah. wish we could have talked a little bit about your upcoming film that you were working on over the last couple of weeks, but uh, maybe we can come back when that gets done. If you if you don't mind coming back and talking with me about it, I would love to hear more. But with that being said, uh, David, thank you so much for coming in and talking with us today. Uh, and it was just a pleasure to sit here for heck two hours and talk yeah. with you, especially since you were you 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 worked on some of the things that influenced me as a filmmaker and as a storyteller uh, as gro- I was growing up. So I just really want you to know that. And I really, well, great. Appreciate, Thank you. I really appreciate all the work y- y'all did and uh, all the passion y'all brought to this franchise. But uh, I'll let great. you get back to it. And uh, thank you so much, man. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See you later. <laughs>